So good morning, I'm Andy Hunt. You can find me on Twitter at Pragmatic Andy and various other places. And I'm going to talk to you this morning about some very random topics that are kind of interesting. And I hope you like them. Um, back in the day, back at the turn of the century, in fact, um, doesn't that sound awful? <laughs> it's like ancient, ancient history. Um, Dave Thomas and I were out consulting, you know, going out slinging code for folks, helping uh, different companies with process, helping them understand what software development was all about and how to get better at it. And what we found was company after company were doing the same things wrong, having the same problems, very, very common problems. So we thought, well, let's just write like a little white paper, just a little guide of things that commonly go wrong or you know, better ways to approach software development. As never happens with software projects, that project grew in scope and scale um, beyond our original white paper, and it became the Pragmatic Programmer book, which was, uh, we wrote it in sort of 98, uh, 99, I think it was actually published late in 99 with a 2000 copyright date. So it's been around for a while. Right as soon as it came out, it was a number nine bestseller on Amazon which kind of shocked us. And that was out of all books. That wasn't just uh, computer books or you know, science and tech or anything. We, uh, we were in the list next to um, uh, some uh, uh, rolling character, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Money, something like that. Um, she had two books in the top 10. So that should have been higher by rights. But I'm not better. I'm not better. That's fine. Um, so we, we had this idea that, you know, there was more to software development than just sitting there slinging code. As if you've done this for more than just a few years, you've probably realized by now there's a lot more to it. So we tried to define, well, what makes a genuine pragmatic programmer? Someone focused on actually getting the work done and not getting distracted by you know, the latest JavaScript framework that just came out and, oh, it's 10 o'clock, we've had three new ones today. You know, what actually gets to the heart of a pragmatic programmer? So we figured, well, you are an early adopter and a fast adapter. That new thing that just came out, yeah, I'll try it. I'll look at it. I mean, I spend a whole lot of time on it, but I'll just get familiar with it. Um, driven by curiosity. Curiosity is like the number one fuel um, that drives us. Critical thinking. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice in this day and age? Um, you know, actually look at some facts before judgment. You know, just because the thread on Reddit said that that framework was great or was crap, do you trust them? You gonna know, look for it for yourself? I would. Um, and being realistic. Hard things take time. They're not easy. But conversely, if something is supposed to be easy and it's taking weeks to do or months to do, hmm, that's a warning sign. Something's not right there. And most important, I think, being a jack of all trades being able to do whatever it takes. You know, the, the current uh, uh, thinking on is, oh, you're a full stack developer, a term I don't really care for particularly. It's like, you're a problem solver. You happen to use code to solve your problems. It could be the front, the middle, the side, the edge. I don't care. It's a problem. We need to solve it wherever it might be. So key to this approach is realizing that none of us are just cogs in a grand machine. Um, and we had this quote in the beginning of the book, page 20 in the preface, apparently. Uh, we who cut mere stones must always be envisioning cathedrals. And I think that's really important. That's something that gets lost a lot in larger, more bureaucratic organizations. You know, a startup really has an advantage there because everyone in a startup is more clearly aligned with the business goal. You know, you, you've got more skin in the game. It's much more important, and I think that's easier to see. You get into something more larger, more entrenched, more bureaucratic, it's easy to say, well, that's not the case here. We're just cogs. We don't want that. We want to stay involved. We don't want to give lame excuses. Uh, the example we used, this was 1999, by the way, was that the cat ate my source code. Now, of course, cats on the internet is a whole thing now, and there is indeed a cat in your folder corrupting your files because it's the internet. Um, but I want to just point out, we had this way first. <laughs> so we don't want lame excuses. We want to say the cat ate my source code. And then the last part of that is to realize, what is software actually made out of? It's made out of people. 
Okay, some folks got it. All right, excellent, excellent. That's actually my age barometer, just to see, you know, the average audience age there. Excellent. Um, it's made out of people, and th this is something that's so easy to lose track of and forget because dealing with people is 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 hard. People are weird. They're stupid. They're crazy. They're you know fill in the blank, and yet that's what we've got to work with. So back around the same time, around 2000. Capers Jones uh, embarked on this really large study of software development practices. And he looked at, I think it was some 600 companies and some 9,000 software projects and tried to document what made a best practice, what, what made a difference, what didn't. And he found some things like, like ISO certification was, was neutral. Didn't help, didn't hurt, didn't make a difference things like that. But right in the very preface of this, this thick book that came out with all these you know, uh, practices enumerated and tabulated, he pointed out that none of the practices you did actually mattered. It was the skill of the people on the team that mattered. He said that without excellent personnel, even an excellent process will only achieve marginal results. So if you've got a highly skilled team, it almost doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're doing an agile approach, if you're doing something to fine tune what you're doing, it's gonna be even better. If you have a very low skill team, a very novice team, it doesn't matter what you do, you're still not gonna be very effective. So it kind of comes down to us. Which brings the point that if you're in a job where you can be told what to do, you will be replaced. That's what automation is for, that's what AI is for, that's what you know, robots are for. Um, fortunately, we're usually not in a position where someone can dictate this is exactly what you're going to do over the next six weeks. It's a little bit more fluid than that. Which brings us to a quick discussion of the Dreyfus model. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Dreyfus model before. Okay. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this, but I will. Anyway. Um, so back in the 70s, these two researchers, Hubert and Stuart Dreyfus, wanted to build an AI that would learn skills the way people learn skills. There was only one problem with this idea. They had no idea how people learned skills. So they had to study that first. And what they came up with, they posited this model where you begin with no experience whatsoever as a novice, work your way up through advanced beginner, competent, and finally to proficient, and lastly, expert. And these aren't hard boundaries. These are sort of soft and fuzzy. You move from one stage, one level, into the next and, and work your way up. And it's per skill. So you're not an expert person. You're an expert chef, an expert programmer, an expert manager. You're a novice accountant, tax preparer, ski instructor, whatever it might be. It's per skill. But the real important thing that they, the insight they had from this was the differences that happen to you as you move up the, the skill levels. So an expert is not just a really smart novice. They're fundamentally different. You change on how you approach problem solving, what mental models you use, how you approach mental models in the first place, how you dispose of old mental models, um, how you consider yourself in relationship to the system, whether you function via rules or intuition, all these sort of uh, axes and more change as you go up the line. So a novice, obviously with no experience whatsoever, the only way you can make them useful is to give them hard and fast rules. When this happens, do that. Right? This is how call centers typically work. They're going down a decision tree. Is it plugged in? Right? And, and down they go. Because they don't really know what they're doing, but they can follow along the rules. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got the expert who does not work by the rules because they're working on deep-seated experience where it manifests itself as intuition. They know this is the right way to go. And they've done studies on this with, with things like um, um, firemen and first responders, where they had figured at first, well, OK, you know, fireman goes in, assesses the situation, look, you know, compares it to familiar other situations in the past, decides on a course of action, you know, marshals the resources, assigns them, deploys them. No, that's not how it goes. Right? Fireman comes in and says, Frank, get over there with the, the, the hook and ladder. You get over there with the thing. You guys go up here. I'm going in here. And it's very you know, um, born of experience, but it's very intuition based. They did a study with airline pilots where they had the expert uh, pilots come up with rules for the novices. 
you know, here's how you land. You do this, you do that, boom, boom, boom. And it improved the novice's um, performance by some measurable percent. It, it worked well. But then they did a trick. They turned around and said, okay, now, Mr. Expert Pilot, you have to follow the rules strictly that you just laid down. And it destroyed their performance by 300%, some, some large number. Um, so we take away from that that you don't want to force experts to follow the novice rules because what you've done is you've dragged their performance level down to that of a novice, which is an interesting concept when we're talking about methodology and process and corporate culture and what all. Um, a novice doesn't know where to focus, how to troubleshoot when there's a problem because right, they don't have the experience on it. So you say something like the XP maxim will test everything that could possibly break. Okay, as an expert, it's like, well, I know this, this part over here is a little shaky. I'm not really you know, convinced about this algorithm. I don't think I did this well. A novice is like, what could break? Everything, right? Print statements could break. I don't know. I'm going to test all the accessors. And so they start writing tests for bloody everything because they can't narrow down the relevant focus of where to actually test. That's the danger of maxims like that and, and you know, little proverbial sayings. You know how to apply them. Software patterns, right? You know how to apply them at the higher levels. At the lower levels, you don't. And I actually ran into a fellow some years back, I think it was in the 90s, uh, where he had just read the Gang of Four patterns book, right? Really enjoyed it and proceeded to wedge something like 17 or 18 of the patterns into this one little piece of code. And it would have made it had, you know, someone not actually noticed and been like, wait a minute, stop. <laughs> That's not what they're for. Um, novices view themselves as a detached observer of the system. Experts realize you're a part of the system. Peter Senge in the fifth discipline, systems thinking, right? You are a part of the code, the code is you, you're a part of the team, that's a part of the organization, as part of the government, it's all connected. Changes to one ripple out to changes on the other. So fine. What does this mean? Well, because we, this is what software is made of, it's made of people, and we have to go through these stages to get better, how do we do that? Well, that's where sort of a problem comes in. I present to you the suck curve. <clears throat> so you start off and you're stuck. You are at some level of expertise, some level of skill, and you just, you're not breaking past that. You're not getting better. Now typically what that means is you have learned what you've learned that f so far in a sort of novice way and now you've got to switch gears and relearn those basic skills in a professional light. So it's like uh, you know Tiger Woods changing his golf grip, or you know a musician learning to play uh, in a different style or you know with a different approach, that sort of thing. And of course, as soon as you do that, as soon as you adapt that that new habit, what happens? Your performance is going to to to, to suck. You're going to be really bad. You're going to go back to functioning like a, like a, a middle school kid at whatever you're doing, right? It's going to be horrible, intolerable even. And so what happens is a lot of folks, there's a crisis then, and then they revert back. Well, that didn't work, right? And then you're still stuck. So the key to any kind of improvement like that is to have the patience to get through the, the trough of the suck curve. You get back up around where you started, and then you get the hockey stick and now you rock at whatever this new thing you've adopted uh, happens to be. But the need for patience in here, I really can't uh, understate. That's absolutely critical. You've got to weather through that and get up to the you rock part. So with that sort of background out there, I want to talk a little bit about um, what we talked about in the pragmatic book for personal level practices, things you should do as a person. But first, just a little bit of neural background. It was thought and taught for many years that you only had a fixed number of neurons once you reached sort of adult size and stature. However many neurons you had, that was it. You were not going to get any more. You could lose neurons, tequila, bourbon, <laughs> beer, wine, whatever it might be, uh, but you wouldn't get any new ones. This was devastating news. Um, and it turns out they were, they were very wrong. 
Because what happened was, when they were studying the primates, when they did this initial study, they studied them in a, uh, in a cage, in a laboratory environment. So they were studying them in a very sterile uh, environment with no um, sensory uh, uh, you know, uh, interaction at all. And so what they actually discovered was that if you put a primate like us in a sterile uh, lab environment with no uh, sensory interaction, then indeed it's a form of brain damage. You're not growing new neurons. They went back and revisited these studies and put the, uh, the primates out in their natural habitat where there's predators, there's you know, all kinds of, of sensory interaction to deal with, and discovered, whoa, look at that. They grow new neurons all the time. In fact, there's an ongoing competition for cortical real estate going on in your brain. So basically, whatever you do the most of, your brain will rewire itself to accommodate that, which is interesting. So they've done taxi, you know, the pre-GPS studies of taxi drivers in London, where they've got entire sections of memory devoted to a, a map of London. Musicians have areas devoted to scales, you know, this sort of thing. You know, we have areas devoted to Reddit and, you know, <laughs> nine gag. Um, so, so this brings us to this fundamental idea of neuroplasticity, which is one of my favorite words. Uh, I'd put that on, on like you know, a license plate on my car, but I don't think it'll fit. Um, so Dr. Dweck from Stanford uh, noticed, she did a study saying, okay, why does it seem that some, some kids, they were, they were looking at a juvenile population, why is it some kids seem to just learn anything that comes at them and some kids get stuck? A fixed mindset, as she called it. And what she determined was that if you believe that there's no limit to what you can learn, it just takes time, it just takes money, it takes effort, but I can do it, then indeed you can learn anything if you take the time and effort to do it. But there are folks who don't think that. They think, well, no, I, I've, I've reached my peak. You know, what, what I learned in, in college or, or high school or grad school, whatever it might be, I'm at some, some fixed limit and I will not be able to learn anything new past that. In both cases, they were right. Because your brain is a self-modifying machine, if you believe you can't learn past a certain point, physically you won't be able to, because that's how your brain has wired itself, if you have that fixed mindset. If you believe that you can increase intelligence and learn anything you want, you will be able to, because your brain will rewire itself physically to accommodate that. That's pretty powerful. And I mean, it sounds a little bit like some kind of California crystal rubbing tree hugging kind of, you know, mumbo jumbo. But I mean, this is, this is okay, it's Stanford. But still, it, you know, this, this actually happens. So, so back in the, in, the, in the Prague Prog book, we said, you know, never stop learning. Learn a new language every year. And that simple statement right there, learning a new language every year, comes as a bit of a shock to new graduates and, you know, folks with less experience. They're like, well, I learned Java. I'm done. I learned JavaScript. Oh, there's two. Okay. You know, have you ever looked at the Tyobe Index? I don't know how you pronounce it, but right, it lists the top 50 or 100 or 200 programming languages in use. There are thousands more, tens of thousands more. It is a rich environment out there, and each one of them will teach you something different about how we think, how we solve problems. So how many people have heard of Elixir? Excellent. Do you know enough to code in it yet? Good, there's something for you to do. Elm, maybe even more important. Elm fixes the horror that is JavaScript. Rust and Nim, if you're into more low-level uh, C systems style thinking, yeah, okay, go, go Rust. Uh, closure, if if you like parentheses, um, awesome. You know, I mean, there's lots of great stuff, and the idea is you you really need to get into it, not just not just look at Stack Overflow entries. Um, you know, cut and paste programming, which we're all guilty of on occasion, but read the long form books. And I don't say that just as owning a publishing company, but please read, <laughs> read our books. Um, but you know, read the books, you know, go to conferences like this, look at the things on YouTube, um, you know, get a mix of modalities, because what we found from the, the cognitive and neuroscience is the more different ways you approach the information, the better uh, connections you make, the more solid uh, it becomes in your brain. 
And of course, it's easy just to not and just to be lazy. So I love this quote uh, attributed to Mark Twain because everything on the net is attributed to Mark Twain, uh, that if you don't read good books, you've got no advantage over someone who can't read at all. Ooh, that hurts. That, that, that's pretty, that kind of gets you where you live. So not to worry, I've come to your rescue today with the pragmatic learning plan. Now I want you to do this. So if you've got something to write on, haul it out, or use your phone, use your, your tablet, your phablet, your Im neural implant, whatever you got going. Um, and we're gonna go through a couple steps here. And I want you to write this down for yourself. So the first thing is to set a regular investment in yourself. Pick a place, pick a time that is consistent, that is quiet, it has no distractions. Um, if you look online, uh, John Cleese of Monty Python fame has a really excellent um, lecture on creativity and the creative process. And he hammers on this point really quite strongly, that you need some place somewhat removed from the daily you know, futs of life to go sit and you know, learn, work on your career, be creative, do what you want to do. So you need a place, you need a time, and then you got to you get there, you got to do something, right? So it's easy enough to say, well, I want to learn Elixir. I want to learn Elm. Fine. But those are lofty ideas. What we want are actual concrete goals. So we go back to the consultant's trick of SMART goals, right? Everyone's heard of this? You know, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time box. So not I want to learn functional programming, but I want to be able to write Hello World in Elm by Monday. Okay, it's concrete, it gives you a deadline, it's achievable, right? You're not going to try and rewrite your current product in Elm by Monday. You know, take small bites, work on it. So you want to figure out what you want to learn. You're here at a conference, stuff is exciting you. What do you want to learn next? Figure out the SMART goals that would correspond to that. And then diversify. Right? So new programming languages, new environments. If you've always done command line, try an IDE. See if it's really as horrible as you remember. Uh, if you've only ever used an IDE, shame upon you. Shame upon your cow. Shame upon your children. Nigh unto five generations. Tr thank you, thank you. Uh, try out the command line. It's not as scary as you think. There's only 26 letters in the alphabet. How scary could it be? Um, Look at new techniques. If you've only ever done object-oriented programming, look at how functional approaches these issues. Look at pipelines versus objects, MVC with a whole bunch of extra Vs in the middle, uh, reactive and async, whatever it might be. See how other stuff works. What can you learn from that? Take ideas from different industries. All right, well, uh, there's a book out long ago, uh, Dave, Dave was real fond of it. Uh, it was a good book on basically on Agile, but it was called How to Open Locks with Improvised Tools. It's a book on lock picking. But they made the point of how context really makes a difference, right? You know, you've got to get through that door. Well, why? The why is critical. You know, the house is on fire, there's a baby on the other side. Okay, that suggests one set of tools, chainsaw, axe, brute force, or it's the Watergate Hotel, it's 2 a.m., you don't want to leave any evidence. Different set of tools, <laughs> entirely. So we can learn things from from other industries. Uh, and non-technical topics, right? The soft skills are critically important because all those messy humans, right? We need to learn more about uh, management, industrial psychology, economics, which is just psychology with money thrown in, um, whatever else. So think of some other topics that you'd like to branch out on and create a rough plan. The most important part being, what's the next action you can take? I'm going to go watch that video on YouTube. I'm going to go to that talk this afternoon. I'm going to go buy a book. Um, you know, whatever it might be. What's the very next thing I can do? And what do I want to accomplish by next year? Is this a career move? Is this something I want to be able to, to you know, move within my organization or change organizations? Is this something I want to add to my toolkit? What benefit will I get from it? Is this something that will improve what I'm working on currently? Whatever it might be, where do you want to be? And what do you see five years from now? Where might this take you? Now, of course, just like project planning, th this part is, is basically nonsense. It's not going to happen that way. Uh, you know, Microsoft will buy that language, that company. You know, the, the feds will strike something down. Facebook will take over the world, whatever. Something will happen. Um, so you have to rebalance. 
Hey, I tried learning OCaml and wow, no, not for me. Sorry, too strange. Uh, I gave it a shot, but I'm going to do something different now, right? The planning is essential, but the plan itself is garbage. So you rebalance every so often. So here's the important part. Set in your calendar, whatever app you're using, whatever technology you're using, and set a date two months from now, say, of when you're going to go and rebalance what you're interested in, what you're looking at, what you want to learn. Because things will have changed. You'll have learned more. You're a different person because you've learned more now. So schedule that. And then the important part is to make this kind of, any kind of change improvement like this, you need to make it stick. So Jerry Seinfeld had this idea of don't break the chain. You put up a big physical calendar and you mark every day that you have touched that subject, even if it's only for a few minutes. If you're sitting down for an hour, a couple hours, awesome. If it's just a couple minutes, touch it every day. It's like your memory is like dynamic RAM, right? You've got to refresh it every so often. And you mark every day that you touch it, and the idea is you don't break the chain. You don't skip a day. It can take, according to some studies, 15, 20, 30 days to ingrain a new habit of any sort. This is why all the gyms empty out after January. Right? No one stuck it through long enough to actually ingrain it as a new habit. So this leads us a little to the next topic of awareness. Right, which uh, there is this great story. I'll give you the short version of it. This lady goes shopping, and somebody, uh, some young punk, comes running down the street, slams into her, keeps running. She's like, "Oh, I've been robbed," you know. But no, she still had her purse, still had her coat and everything. Some guy just ran into her on the street and kept running. Fine. She goes shopping, goes about her business, talks to the butcher, sees a couple neighbors. None of them noticed, or none of them said anything. That, but she had the handle of a six-inch steak knife sticking out of her neck. Okay, so she goes about her business, gets home. Her, her daughter or daughter-in-law, I forget, it's like, oh my God. Uh, she was fine. I mean, they, you know, they called the, the, the EMTs and they sewed her up and she was fine. But the, the, the shock to the system of getting slammed was enough so she didn't notice the fact she had a knife sticking out of her throat. Why none of her uh, associates pointed out, you know, excuse me, you, see, you have a little something. To, <laughs> You know, so I use this example to point out that if you can miss something like a knife sticking out of your neck, what else might we miss in the uh, daily uh, issues of a project, right? We can miss it quite a lot. So feedback, feedback, feedback. We want to know, not guess. We need some kind of feedback to confirm what's going on. Are we done? Can we shorten the feedback gap to get feedback as fast as possible? We want, this is why you want unit tests that run right then and there so you know whether it works. You don't want to wait six months or a year from now when some poor schlep of a user tries it and it's like, oh, okay, that doesn't work. Do you remember writing that last year? No, I don't. You know, five seconds ago, sure. Um, and you know, it's important not to rush to action. There have been a number of studies where you know, culturally we're, we're pushed in this idea of I must act immediately, that that's a sign of, of strength and power, and no, that's actually wrong. You need to sit and think about it a little bit before you jump in, especially when trying to find a bug, right? Don't immediately jump to where the bug is and try and fix it. Try and cause it a couple different ways. You know, get your head around the whole scope of the situation before you wade in and start making sense, uh, changes. Make sure there's a test that exposes that bug before you start to fix it, right? Common sense. And of course, if, if it's hard to get feedback sometimes, then there's always, wait for it, there he is, the rubber duck, all right? This uh, uh, grad uh, student friend of, of Dave's did this in, um, in college where you're stuck at something, you stick the, the rubber duck up on your, your desk and you explain the problem to the duck. Right? Because doesn't this happen, right? You're stuck on something and, and your friend comes over and you start explaining it and three quarters, you know, halfway through the explanation, you're like, ah, I see it. I see what it was. There's actual neurological reasons why that works, but we, we don't have time for that today. So just trust me, yes, that works. You should do it. We prefer ducks, you can use something else, but you know, if you explain it to, pretend you're explaining it to someone else, it's a very valuable technique uh, to get your own feedback. And when discussing issues of technology, 
you know, it really, it really saddens me for people to say, you know, this framework is the right answer. Your framework sucks. Your framework is wrong. Your language is wrong. Your development environment is wrong. Um, there's no right and wrong. It's trade-offs and consequences, right? Engineering is all about trade-offs. You know, this might work well here, but not there. This is why it kind of really annoys me when people talk about best practices. Best for who? Under what circumstances? Well, it worked for us. Well, great. My company's not like yours. Mine's small. Yours is large. V vice versa. You've got skilled people. I've got novices. Other way around, wherever it might be. So when we talk about something, you know, the, the trade-offs that we're looking at and, and the consequences we face, it's always bounded by this particular context, this size project, this technology, this kind of company. And context is absolutely critical, and we tend to try to abstract that away. You know, I think it's part of our, our you know, programming background. We're just like, oh, that doesn't matter. Let's just look at the thing. No, systems thinking again, you have to look at the whole. Because if you take things out of context, you might get the wrong idea. Uh, so for instance, we were talking before about uh, breaking the door and using a, ch a chainsaw or, or an ax to get through the door, right? An ax is a, is a great tool. I've, I've used it to take trees down and do some yard work. But in the wrong context, you know, just... <laughs> you might get the wrong idea. Um, similarly, if, if you're, a, a, you're at the bank or doctor's office or, or HR, they've got like the little bowl of candy out for, for free candy, right? But you know, that's not always <laughs> what you think. So context, context, context. We want to fix broken windows. This was a, a real key tip number four, right? So very early in the book, the idea that you need to fix problems as soon as they occur. Because if you don't, they start causing collateral damage. That bug that you ignore grows, it gets bigger, it damages other things. And so you get this kind of domino effect, this escalation where everything is broken, nothing can be fixed, and you've lost control of the code base. You get code rot. You can get process rot the same way. Well, we do four stand-up meetings and we all go fill out timesheets for the next hour, right? No, that's no, <laughs> just no, that's just wrong. Um, you wanna fix something as soon as you notice it's broken. Now, that's not always possible, right? This is broken, but to fix this is gonna take us six months, a couple weeks. This is a big effort to try to fix this. Fine, board it up, right? Put police tape around it. Like, yes, we know it's broken. We've scheduled it. It's going to be on an iteration, you know, four, four things from now. We're going to get to it. That works. Because then you avoid this idea of hopelessness being contagious, right? It's like, yes, we are on top of it. It's not just lying there like some tenement slum where they did the original uh, broken windows theories. The other thing I'd like to add to this is that good programmers remove broken code. Less experienced programmers add patches. And I love this picture. This, this is a patch on top of a patch on top of, this is JavaScript written, I don't know. But you'll know, find, find step three here. It's like, ah, no, very difficult. So we want to try to remove code. And why do we do that? We want to keep things simpler than you think possible, which is a nice segue into pragmatic tools here. Because complexity, destroys our ability to understand it. And we are really expert at making things harder than they need to be. It's a core competency. We're really good at that. Um, and you know, Dijkstra said back in the 70s and then reiterated uh, nicely in the late 90s that we have to keep things crisp, disentangled, and simple, or we're gonna be crushed by complexities of our own making. And I think with our current you know, front-end web stack, there's a lot of weight. The higher the stack gets, the more the crushing <laughs> can happen, right? Um, we've got some issues there. So I talk about complexity, right? There's a, two different kinds. There's essential complexity. That's the business problem. That's the actual essence of the problem. That's the real hard part. But then there's accidental complexity self-inflicted wounds. My favorite classical example of this, you try to teach a young child, you know, someone 10 years old, say, 10-year-old kid, you try to teach them Java, and they want to put out a hello world string. Great. Well, before you can do that, before we can talk about print, you have to type public static void main parenthesis string bracket bracket args bracket close brace brace. 
and they give you this look. <laughs> like, you've got to be kidding me. What does that mean, and does that ever change? No, that never changes, you always type that. What does it mean? Well, it's the entry point for the program. Then why the bloody hell doesn't it say entry point to the program? <laughs> And then you start trying to, and then it goes downhill from there, right? Accidental complexity. This just came through Twitter the other day. What's three times two, if you put the two in quotes? Well, it depends, don't it? In JavaScript, it's at, one answer at least is six. You could probably get more out of it. Python says it's 222 as a character string, and C sharp to, declares that's equal to 150. <laughs> so, we do this to ourselves all the time, right? Another, and, and you can really take to Twitter to see, you know, people do these jokes in frustration with the working conditions and what they have to put up with. And this is an oldie but a goodie. What's Bower? Well, it's a package manager. Install it with NPM. What's NPM? It's a package manager. You install it with Brew. What's Brew? <laughs> <laughs> Turtles all the way down, mate. Turtles all the way down. So we need to kind of break our habit, uh, our, our addiction to accidental complexity, fun though it is. And for an interesting uh, counterexample, look at the command line from Unix, right? Shell programming for the win. Small, simple tools that do one thing and you pipeline them together. This was a very popular concept. It, it has led to a lot of interesting stuff and you see this in you know, genuine, you know, you know, higher level programming languages. You see it in F sharp, you can see it in Elixir, the idea of pipelining simple functions together. Uh, how, you know, why do we unit test? Why do we test in small pieces? Because that's the best way to test a chain is one link at a time, right? Otherwise, you've got this big 60 foot chain and it snaps, it breaks, well, what went wrong? I don't know. It snapped in eight places where I don't know now. It's all, it's destroyed. My only choice is to start over. Or you test it link by link, and when one link fails, it's easier to check it in isolation. It's easier to you know, fake inputs and outputs to it. Whatever. It's a very interesting, different way of looking at problems. I commend it to you. We want to stick in this mode of simplicity and trying to make things easier on ourselves. We want to stick to plain text. Plain meaning it's human readable. So XML is right out. Right? Uh, it can be massaged with common tools, CSV, humble any files, YAML, you know, anything that's in plain text that you can get in and work with is going to be much simpler to deal with. So, okay, that's, that sounds fair enough. And we suggested on tip 38 that metadata along these lines was a, a good idea, that you should put the abstractions hard in the code, but leave the details out in metadata in plain text where it's easy to change. Sounds like a reasonable approach, right, right? Well, but only if it helps. Some years after this uh, went to press, we were out talking to a client and they proudly said, guys, I loved your tip, number 38, about using metadata and we do it for everything in our project. We have 44,000 configuration variables. Wait for, that ain't the punchline. <laughs> I mean, interesting as that is, we said, wow, that's, something and it was it was crushing them because to add a new field to their product was like a six month process because you had to add it to all these admin screens you had to add all the support for configuring the variable and and you know all the rest of the stuff it was a huge huge mess and we said well 44 configuration variables that's a lot of change how many clients you know, what's the size of your client base 14 <laughs> so sure but only if it helps. You know, first step, how about 14 configuration variables? Client A, client B, client C, and you know, Bob's your uncle. Um, but that's a, a, an interesting case to me if you take taking some advice ludicrously the wrong way and now you've trapped yourself. You've introduced so much accidental complexity that you can't get out of your own way. And getting out of your own way is critical, right? The segue, I think, is it should be the patron saint of programming. Because what does, what is a segue's distinguishing feature? What does it do? It constantly adjusts, right? Doesn't matter if you're going uphill, downhill, turning, accelerating, leaning, it adjusts 
and does what you intend to do. That's the kind of development that we want to do. We want to stay close to the problem domain, avoiding accidental complexity. We want to try, you know, use a language that supports a REPL so you can get in and type and try things and see what happens. Get that instant feedback. Re huh. Y'all have squirrels? <laughs> All right, well, I'm not under the chandelier, so I'm, I got no skin in this game. <laughs> Y'all in the middle there might want to keep an eye out. Uh, dynamic, flexible languages, you know, are probably easier to work with, less accidental complexity. You know, you start looking at some horrible nested thing in Java with 14 inner classes and this and that, or you have one or two lines in Ruby, Python, something else, that's something to consider. You know, try not to let the language force you into a corner and introduce yet more accidental complexity. So let's talk about some design principles while we're in that area, in that neck of the woods. The Prague Prague book on tip 11 introduced the dry principle. That every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. There's one place to go that says, yes, that is what, what this is defined to be. There might be copies of it. There might be you know, things that are generated from that, but there's one authorita authoritative place. Because if the knowledge changes, which knowledge does, this gives you one place to go to fix it. All right? So okay, we're kind of used to this in the sense of copy and paste coding. You know, we try to maintain dry so that we don't duplicate bugs because you know, Murphy's, the fourth corollary to Murphy's law is if you copy and paste code, you've copied a bug and pasted it, and now you've got, you've introduced more accidental complexity. Um, but look at, you know, modern uh, things with, with Ansible and, and such, that's an interesting kind of note, because now you're specifying your infrastructure once, or should be. You know, your production machines are probably set up using the, this level of technology, and maybe that's under version control, I hope, but what about your dev machines? Are they set up the same way? Or does everyone set up their, their own machines however they want and you hope all the versions line up? Something to think about. How do you provision it? Is that really dry? We want to keep unrelated things unrelated because it's easier. It's easier to change. We want to increase cohesion and reduce coupling. This next is one of my favorite all-time slides, talking about cohesion. Unix shell tools, do one thing, do one thing well. Or the counter example, the convertible sofa bedroom piano. From an 1866 patent, um, this, is, this is also the inspiration for C++. <laughs> A little bit. Um, this does not do one thing well, and in fact probably doesn't do any of these things even halfway decent at all. Do you think that's a good piano? Is that going to be a comfortable place to sleep? No. Probably not. And yet we write code like that far too often, far too much. So we want to increase cohesion. Do one thing. What does this function method class package instance box, what does it do? Should it be doing all those things? Is that a cohesive use of that resource? Does it just do this? Or do you have some extra mattresses and pianos bolted on? Um, and of course, the, the classic example is where you see a, a piece of OO code that talks about a you know, blah, blah, blah manager. It's like whoop, 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 danger sign. It's doing all kinds of different things that it probably shouldn't be doing. We want to try and reduce coupling, dependencies between things. Uh, dependencies are a real uh, horrible mess. Sometimes we accidentally introduce dependencies on the real world, using an area code as a key or a postal code. Well, we found out the hard way from disasters natural and man-made, postal codes can simply disappear. Right? There's, there's nothing cast in stone there. So you've got domain coupling, something like that, tied to the real world. Temporal coupling, dependent on time or order. Static and dynamic uh, compile and runtime coupling. There's a lot of ways we can you know, twist our shorts up um, and get tangled up here. So here's a thought. Try just writing a function, not a framework. Not, especially not in JavaScript, not a library, not even a method, just a function. Do one thing, pass it on. No side effects. Item potent if you want to get fancy and, and impress people. But just do one thing and pass it on. See how that works for you. See how that increases 
uh, cohesion and decreases coupling, right? And from there, we want to look at, you know, the real state we want to get to is the idea of disposable software. We want to stop treating software as precious. We spend so much ink and effort you know, through the 90s, through the 2000s, trying to make you know, extensible software, make it reusable. Right? That is a complete and utter waste of time. You're not going to reuse it, not in that sense. Make it replaceable. Make it so I can rip it out easily, cleanly, and replace it with something that I write that's not as stupid as the first thing that I wrote. Right? Because after you've written it and shipped it, then it's always, oh, you know, I should have done this other thing instead. Right? Fine. Let's work with that. You don't try and fight that. Make it replaceable. Right? So here's Andy's design razor. If you can't rip every piece out, then the design sucks. Right? And I love, I love this picture. Right? Do not touch any of these wires. OK. You betcha. Um, you can't change anything in here. I mean, this is the very picture of spaghetti code realized in hardware. Um, but that's what we try to do. But so think about replacing it, right? If it's replaceable, then it's easy to test. That means you've got a better design. If it's impossible to test, that's the warning sign that the code is crap. And I love this. You know what this guy's doing here in this picture? He's testing football helmets in the early 1900s. And the way you would test a football helmet is you got some poor sucker to put the helmet on, run and slam his head into the wall and see you know, how, he, how he did afterwards. <laughs> that is not how we want to test code. <laughs> we also want to program deliberately instead of programming by coincidence. This is the old paint. Here's a graphics context. Nothing came out. Hmm, OK. Well, invalidate. Nothing came out. Validate. No, revalidate. And he's starting to get, damn it, you know, in here. Repaint. Paint immediately. <laughs> Finally, somewhere in that mess, something squirted out to the screen. Awesome. Ship it. <laughs> Ever find yourself saying this can't happen? I used to put print statements in saying, we'll never get here. And of course, you know, somebody phones up and they're like, we've broken the system. It said it couldn't get here. And it's, it's ah. <clears throat> Use assertions. Assertions are a fabulous tool. Don't take them out in production. I know a guy, I won't reveal his name or his company, but they built a hardware product. And their claim to fame was they left all the assertions that they put in during development, they left in the production code. So when something in the field broke, they knew exactly where it was, what the state of key variables were remotely, and they could fix it. He sold his company for a billion dollars. Just saying. Use assertions. Uh, look it up, don't guess. Rely only on reliable things, which brings us back to NPM and left pad. You know the left pad story, right? Not left shark, left pad. Right? Here is this one thing that broke thousands of projects in 11 lines of JavaScript because he it, the situation came that left pad got unpublished from the NPM repository. It's a popular package. It was more than, than uh, what, 2 million downloads a month. And people were using live dependencies uh, in their production workflow. So this thing got pulled, and the world fell apart. You're not relying on a reliable thing. If you're relying on somebody else's repo that you don't control, you don't control it. Crash. Don't trash. Dead programs tell no lies. If you don't crash, then you're just causing more random, more collateral damage elsewhere in the system. And interestingly, Joe Armstrong, one of the inventors of Erlang, said, you know, defensive programming is a complete waste of time. Let it crash. What you want to code for is, well, what do we do when it does crash? Here's what we're going to restart. Here's how we're going to restart it. And that logic is the basis of supervisor trees in the Erlang VM, which is how Erlang gets nine nines uptime, which if you do the math is, is what, like a half second a year, tenth of a second a year, something like that? You know, that's how you do it. It's going to crash. OK, let's embrace that. Now what do we do to get around it? So Andy's three R's. Write code that you can read easily, reason about clearly, and most importantly, replace quickly. That's the, that's the real win right there. Uh, real quick, let me just skate through 
a pragmatic environment, because obviously everyone does this now. Everyone uses version control, right? Four, thank you. I didn't used to get that answer. 10, 15 years ago, you'd ask that, and the back third of the audience would sheepishly know. You know, well, what do you do? Well, it's a big shared disk. Everyone just edits, and last one in wins. <laughs> I had well, one uh, company tell me, yes, we use version control. We use Microsoft uh, uh, Outlook. <laughs> Outlook, are you, are you sure about that? It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't source unsafe or some other product? No, no, we use Outlook. At the end of the day, we all mail the code to each other, so there's a copy on the server. Not that. <sighs> unit test. Andy, do I have to write unit tests for all my code? No, of course not. Let's put that myth to rest right here. You don't have to write it for all the code, only the code you want to work. <laughs> Automate. Obviously, you can't have continuous build, continuous deploy, and continuous monitoring if you've got manual procedures. All that crap needs to be automated. That's what computers are good at. If you're doing that by hand, you're a fool. Straight up. Don't do that. That needs to be automated. That was tip 42, an auspicious number. Test or your users will. Yeah, and they're not so nice about it. Um, the key thing here is that if you find a bug manually, once QA finds it, customer finds it, you find it, add that to your automated suite, wherever it is, whether it's an acceptance test, a unit test, whatever level it's at, because you were lucky to find it in that context. And you don't want to rely on luck to find it again. You want to automate it. We want continuous potential delivery, always ready to ship something. Every time you check something in to the server, to the mainline branch of the product, many times a day, that is ready to show to a customer. If it's not, you're doing something wrong. It may not be complete, that's fine. But what's there actually works. We want continuous development, because development does not happen in phases, right? And people still think that there's a phase gate approach, design, testing, integration, release, lawsuit, reorg. Um, <laughs> You know, we don't want to go through, definitely don't want to go through these last several phases here. Um, we want to literally be agile, right? And when uh, Venkit Subramaniam and I wrote uh, the Practices of an Agile Developer book, I came up with this definition, because we didn't have one at that point, that agile development uses feedback, which I've been hammering on, to make constant adjustments in a highly collaborative environment, right? So instead of phase gate approach, we want tracer bullets. Right? Just like when you're, when you're shooting, you've got the little tracers to show you real-time feedback where your ordinance is landing. That's what we want for development, real-time feedback. We do that by doing end-to-end -end development. The very first day of the project, Hello World, goes all the way end-to-end. -end. It touches every piece that's going to be there. The front end, the middleware, the database, whatever you've got. It's skeletally thin. It's stubbed out. It's literally Hello World, but it touches all the pieces and then you grow as you go along. Finally, I want to end up with a, just a quick look at Conway's law, which isn't really a law. It's more a, a frequently observed phenomenon. But good old Mel Conway back in 1968, and he's still on Twitter, by the way. Uh, he pointed out that very often, the design of your software is going to mirror the communication pathways of your corporation, your organization. So you remember that old uh, campa ad campaign where things start to look alike and people start to look like their dogs? This happens in software. You take a look at your org chart, then you take a look at your, your system, and they can be remarkably similar. The most interesting case I had, there was this uh, uh, one customer back at the time, beautiful offices, right? Curved office building, all the developers had an outside window, right? It was gorgeous, but linear. Right? So you had the whole team spread out on windows. And we're doing the consultant dance. You go and talk to the first person. Ah, tell me about yourself. What are you all building? Well, we're building this great thing. It works like this. It's, it's a, a, a fat client. Everything's on the client. Razor thin database. It's just a data store. Here are the features, blah, blah, blah. Fine. We go down. We start talking to everybody. And the story starts to change. Not all at once. Little by little, little here, little there. We get to the very last person on the end, and she says, oh yes, razor thin client, totally fat database, everything is in stored procedures on the back end. They'd flipped 180 degrees over the course of 25, 30 people, little by little. Come to find out, 
the folks on this end, everyone only associated with the two or three people sort of nearest to them in line. So these folks would go out to lunch together, and these folks would go out to lunch together, and the folks on the end never talked to each other, just from the physical layout uh, of the thing. So we got them, uh, <laughs> we straightened them out a little bit, got them doing just a simple scrum, the real scrum stand-up that's only 15 minutes, and you know, pox upon you if it's longer than that. Um, and they got that straightened out. But clearly the communication pathways were the big problem there. So we want the team to focus on learning. Conversation, painful as it is, is the best way to do that. We want chats, not memos. We want understanding, not documentation. That scrum stand-up meeting, it's a team synchronization point. It's like a sync point in code. It's not a status report to brass. It's not a problem-solving session. It's a synchronization session. We want to push information out information radiators. You've had success on your project. You've learned something new. Let everyone know. That's important stuff. Because ultimately, we want to delight the users, right? The very last tip, or next to last tip, I think, talking about gently exceeding your users' expectations, going that one extra step. You don't want to give them something completely different and freak them out, or potentially make it not usable. But to know their needs well enough and give them that one little extra thing to really delight them. And then finally, the last one, sign your work. Be proud of it. We used to put Easter eggs in you know, software from the development team because we were proud of what we had built, what we had done. No, it's not perfect. It'll never be perfect. This book's 20 years old, and there's, there's issues with it. There's technology we raved about that doesn't exist anymore. You know? But the principles are sound. The advice is sound. I hope you found it helpful today. Let me wrap up by giving you a couple things. There's, so that was mostly from the Pragmatic Programmer book. The uh, cognitive and learning stuff is from Pragmatic Thinking and Learning, Refactor Your Wetware. Some more agile stuff from Practices of an Agile Developer. I wrote a book on uh, Minecraft for the kids because there's no better way to get kids interested in Java than by having them create a gun that shoots flaming cows that explode on contact. <laughs> really gets their attention. Um, I've just completed a science fiction novel. If you're interested uh, in soft sci-fi, uh, drop me a line, let me know. I'm on Twitter at Pragmatic Andy. Oh, that book's, that's at conglomora with two Ms, dot com. Uh, toolshed.com is my homepage. Uh, Grow's method is a thing uh, I've been starting up trying to get a different approach to agile methods. Uh, the Pragmatic Bookshelf is at pragprog.com. We've got some laptop and iPhone stickers up here if you didn't get one coming in. Uh, feel free to help yourself afterwards. Thank you all for having me. Thank you.